You're listening to Online Pet Health Podcasts with Dr. Megan Kelly, continuing education for veterinarian rehabilitation therapists. Learn more at OnlinePetHealth.com. Hey, Vet Rehabbers. It really warms my heart to see all the pics of everyone around the world who met up last week for Vet Rehabbers Day. Thank you for all of you for getting together. It was so, so wonderful. We had such a great meetup in Cape Town. And I know that everyone, wherever you were around the world meeting up, it was so great to see everyone together on Vet Rehabbers Day. So one group even had a TV crew following them, co-vet rehabbers, getting into the media and sharing some vet rehab love far and wide. So awesome. We're having a great month of learning this month on the online Pet Health membership. Um, in our small animal membership, we're learning about 2D and 3D kinematics of lameness and dogs and wearables and remote sensing technology for disease prevention. These were lectured by Constantia Alvarez. In our equine membership, Constantia also did a lecture on the relationship between limbs and vertebral columns in health and pain. And it's also the start of our equine tendon series, which is a series of lectured by Gillian Tabor. Big thank you to Respond System for sponsoring those webinars. In the Hydra membership, Jessica Bodworth joins us with a lecture on carpal conditions and hydrotherapy. For those of you that are not familiar with our online pet health membership, we have many tailored options for all of you. So you can either be a small animal, a hydro or an equine member. And we also have a dual membership, which is the hydrotherapy and small animal together and a multi, which is all three. So what do you get for your monthly membership? Well, you get access to the whole library of recordings. At the moment, we have 206 hours in the small animal membership, 103 in the hydro membership, and 140 in the equine membership. Every month, we add a new uh, webinar to the library. You also get access to a whole library of business training, free VIP access to our annual Vet Rehab Summit. The dates this year are the 10th and 11th of November. That's even valued at $495. So it's a huge, huge bonus to get free VIP access to that event. We also have our mentorship program, and this is both in clinical and business, and you can sign up on a month-to-month basis, or you can join annually for even more savings. So if you want to find out more, you can go to onlinepetal.com. Today we're taking a snippet from one of our workshops at our Vet Rehab Summit from last year and Katie Ford was there talking about imposter syndrome. This is something that a lot of us professionals suffer from. Some of us are aware of it, some of us aren't. Katie gives us some great tips on how to recognize this condition. She doesn't like to label us as having um, imposter syndrome. So we have this, sy- this syndrome or condition. I, th- I think we've sort of changed it now. We like to talk about imposter moments. But she'll share with you some tips on how exactly to manage it. So over to Katie. Yay. Thank you so much for having us, first of all. And secondly, welcome, everybody. We are so excited to talk about this super important, super relevant topic that comes up for so many people and can sometimes make us feel like we're standing in our own way. But we're going to give you some actionable steps, some tips and tricks, some reflective prompts that will really help you start taking some action when you maybe feel like a bit of an imposter, like perhaps that little voice is coming in from time to time and trying to tell you all the reasons why you don't deserve it. So let us get started. So we're going to do a quick intro to us so you know who you are working with today and who's speaking to you. So I'm going to let Claire go first. Claire, introduce yourself to the guys. Amazing. First of all, thank you so much for having us. We are super, super excited to be here with you today. So I'm Claire. I'm a veterinary surgeon. Um, I've been qualified for 15 years now, which doesn't seem quite possible. And I've been spent seven years in small animal private practice. I then spent seven years in charity practice and have been self-employed for the last 12 months. So I've had a wide variety of roles within the profession, including in management and leadership experience. And as Katie said, we came together in December 2020 to create Vet Empowered. And my own journey into coaching came from more challenges that I had been facing in my personal life. So I went through divorce. I lost several close friends within a short space of time who passed away. And the relationship I was in broke down. And 
I just found myself in a space where I knew that something needed to change, but I didn't know what it was. So from the outside, it looked like everything was sorted. I was in my full-time charity role in management as a vet. I had a beautiful house. I was going on the holidays. I had lots of friends. But inside, the one thing that was missing was I didn't have a relationship with myself. And I believe that the negative voice that I heard in my head all the time was really me. And it was causing me to feel actually quite unhappy inside. So I did two things. The first thing was I went to therapy, not for the first time, but it was the first time that I'd really been just for me. And I was in therapy for six months. And I was also coached as well as part of a group program. And I got to the end of that six months and it honestly been so transformational that I decided that that was what I was going to pursue. Um, and I did my coach training. I've done further training in meditation and breath work and also somatic coaching, which is working with the body and the nervous system. And I decided that I really wanted to support others in the same way that I had been supported to just develop that really strong self-relationship, which is ultimately the foundation for everything that we do. So I reached out to Katie because I knew Katie was already within sort of the veterinary space and already coaching initially with the intention of her being my mentor. So we ended up jumping on a Zoom call and chatting for about two hours and then came off the Zoom call. And a few hours later, I got the longest WhatsApp message I've ever had, basically saying, I've had an idea for a coaching program. Like, do you want to come on board and run it with me? And that's how we started Vet Empowered. And It's just been an amazing, amazing journey since then, supporting others within the veterinary profession and the animal health industry as well. And we're so passionate about what we do here. So we're super grateful to have been invited along to run this workshop for you. And I'll pass back over to Katie. Otherwise, we could be here all day. (laughs) I love a chat. Thank you so much for the amazing intro, Claire, and explaining a little bit of our story, how we form too. So I know many of you in the community I've spoken to previously, I've been on the podcast with Meg too, so you've heard quite a lot of my journey. Essentially, I'm also a qualified vet, 10 years now. I did an internal medicine certificate. I used to, as a background, do a lot of dog training as well. I used to do a lot of agility. I used to do quite a lot of fly ball too. And that meant that I even started my animal rehab certificate in the first couple of years of practice as well. So we have worked with a lot of people, not just within the vet space, in the animal health space as well. And my own story was similar to Claire's in the fact that I was listening to this negative voice in my head that was always telling me I wasn't good enough. No matter what I did, it always told me that I didn't deserve it. I wasn't good enough. Someone was going to find me out. That was whether I was in practice and I've got cases that were going to plan. It would always discount them and say, well, anyone could have done that, Katie. Actually, you know what? You just passed that exam or that qualification because you've just come out of vet school and you remember how to do Harvard referencing. And I was constantly chasing the next thing. You know, when I get my internal medicine certificate, then I'll feel like I'm doing a good job. I'd get it. And then I wouldn't feel any different because it would still be blabbering on in the background and tell me all the reasons why I'd fluked it or why I hadn't done a good enough job. And when I went through my own path as well, that started with therapy as some support and then similar to Claire coaching, my life really did change. And I realized, you know what, that voice wasn't me. And underneath I was valuable. I always say on one of my Instagram posts that I had 27 letters after my name, but none of them gave me me. And that's why Claire and I align so much, because it really does come down to how we're treating ourselves. And so often we're listening to that negative narrative that we never chose, that tries to make us believe that we're small, we're an imposter, we're not good enough. Sometimes it pipes up from time to time, sometimes it shouts really loudly. And both of us still listen and still have those things that do pipe up, but actually we understand it differently. And that's why we're passionate at Vet Empowered about helping align people with what's important to them as unique individuals. What lights them up? What do they want their lives to be about? How are they treating themselves? And what does their self-relationship look like to them as well? So that's where we're going to come together, share some of our knowledge and expertise. As we said, we've both trained as coaches. We've both done extra studies. You can see on the screen some of the things that we've done as well. I'm just in the middle of finishing up my master's. We are so passionate about this. So we cannot wait today to spend a few hours with you and help you start to realign on what's important to you, start to understand that little imposter narrative that pipes up and gives us those imposter moments or sometimes it's grumbling in the background. And also for you to have some actionable tools that you can use moving forward out of this. 
So what can you expect today? So you're going to learn what is the imposter phenomenon a little bit more. Many of you have heard me go more in depth on this when I did the session back earlier this year as well, but we're going to do a brief recap. The types of imposter pressures so we can start noticing those understanding our somatic experiences of imposterism, realizing that quite often we feel it in our body and it's an experience that we go through as much as a thought process, which is a super key part. To describe when imposter thoughts might arise for you, for us to redefine confidence and what it actually means and how we can start to build that as something that we can use and sit into when that little imposter narrative comes up. So we are gonna do a brief recap now around what the imposter phenomenon is, and then we're going to start talking a little bit more around the narratives that come up. So let's start off with what is the imposter syndrome? And we're going to ban the word syndrome. What is imposter phenomenon? And many of you heard me do this session back in July, so I'm not going to spend a huge amount of time on this. But just so we know, if we head to the dictionary and we find the official definition, it is the persistent inability to believe that one's success is deserved or has been legitimately achieved as a result of one's own efforts or skills. So we get that little voice that pops in and tells us why we don't deserve it, even though all of the facts are on paper in front of us. Most of the statistics out there point to it being around 70% of the population that are affected. The reality is loads of studies out there cite anything between sort of 5% and 89%, depending on who you're speaking to as well. When we speak very frequently within the veterinary and animal health spaces. And it's usually 90 to 100% of people say they've experienced that at some point because we're all human, right? Sometimes that little voice in our head is going to Twitter away and tell us all the reasons why we've hoodwinked everybody. First documented in the 1970s by a couple of psychologists who started to realize that they were having the same conversations with high achievers and particularly amongst women at that point. But since then, in the reviews, it's been shown to affect all genders. And finally, and we talked about this a lot when we were talking about um, this back in July, how might that look in our careers? That might be that sometimes we, we don't go for the new job or the opportunity because we don't feel like we're qualified enough to do it. It might be that we decide that we didn't earn the success or that it was down to a fluke or it was just luck. It might be that when someone congratulates us, we don't feel like we earned it. It might be that when we have something that doesn't go to plan, we suddenly feel that in that moment, my goodness, I've scammed everyone. I shouldn't be here. I don't deserve it. I'm not good enough. It might be that when we go for an opportunity that we don't speak up, we don't ask the question because that voice tells us, why would we want to hear from you? You've just coasted your way along here. It might be that we decide that anything that we've done well is just, oh, I just winged it. I just made it up as I went along. And we haven't put the conscious attention to the work that we did put in. So realizing that we're not the only ones to experience this can be really valuable, but it doesn't make it any less uncomfortable. And that's why we wanted to remind you that you're not alone. If that's something that's come up and you think, oh my goodness, that's me. First of all, it's not a fault. We see syndrome so often, and particularly with you guys as well, in um, an industry where you are diet and well, you're using medical terms, we hear the word syndrome and we think, oh my gosh, there's something wrong with me. It's it's a problem. It's a fault. The reality is the word syndrome just means a set of signs that come up at the same time. And quite often, as you'll learn, feeling like an imposter can come along as we're pushing comfort zones, as we're doing new things, as we've got challenges presented to us. Maybe when we're more tired, like there'll be times for all of us when it pops up. So realizing that there are celebrities out there that talk about it. There are leaders in every industry that will talk about sometimes doubting themselves. And it doesn't have to mean that you can't do the things that you choose to do. And it doesn't mean you're not valuable if something doesn't go to plan. And it doesn't mean that you're getting things wrong if sometimes that pops up. We're going to give you some real actionable steps and things that you can do. So just that reminder that you're not alone. Some of the most accomplished people on this planet will sometimes doubt how they got there. And if you head to Google and Google celebrities with imposter syndrome, you'll find hundreds of stories of people that we idolize saying, every time a new movie came out, I just have this voice in my head saying, you got away with that one again. So let's take some pressure off. And we're going to talk a bit more around like the somatic experience of it as well, because let's be honest, it feels uncomfortable, right? When we have whether it's a, an ongoing grumbling narrative or if it's a, a moment where that little imposter gremlin comes in and tells us all the reasons that we don't deserve it, it feels uncomfortable. 
And that's where we want to give you some um, tips and insights and things to try remembering that we're all individual. And how do we define it? And we have touched on this before, but I think it's super important for us to remember this is that it's not a clinical condition. Imposter syndrome, imposterism, imposter phenomenon, we'll just call it imposter experience, isn't a clinical condition that we get diagnosed with. It's what we call a reaction to a set of stimuli. Something happens and it's a narrative that comes up as a result of something happening. So that might be growth quite often. And sometimes there are situations in which where we're growing and we don't realize that we're actually growing. We don't realize that it's growth. It feels, we, oh, well, I, I, I don't think I'm growing at all. Why is it still coming up? You're in a varied industry where you're presenting with different things every single day. So whilst there are some studies saying that imposterism and imposter thoughts can exist alongside things like anxiety, depression, reduced job satisfaction, we know that it is a phenomenon rather than being a clinical condition. So when might it come up for us? And why is it important for us to know when it might come up for us? Because that means that then we can say, oh, hang on one second, I'm about to go and take a new job role or I'm coming back after some time off or I'm about to develop my business further or I'm about to start a new social media account or I'm about to write a paper, I'm about to take on more work or I've just done a new qualification. This is a time where it's probably going to pop up and that's okay. Let me remember all the stuff that Katie and Claire spoke to me about so that I can start to implement some of that. So that might be exams or achievements. It might be a new job. It might be when we graduate, when we've completed a qualification, when we've had a challenging patient that we've been dealing with. It might be we get um, an award, a promotion, we win something. And then just briefly, where could this have come from? And again, we've spoken about this before, but it's super important that we clarify this at the beginning. I want you all to remember when you first came into this world, we didn't know anything about it. You came here, valuable, unique, one-off. There are studies out there that Claire and I talk about frequently. There's the Bin Nazar study from Harvard in 2017, where they worked out the odds of you being you and you being born. And that was worked out at you being you at one in 400 trillion which was the odds of your parents meeting them, deciding that they were going to be in a relationship, have children, gamete formation, which is pretty mind blowing, right? You've seen kids when they're young, when they're one or two years old, they think they're brilliant. They think they're the center of attention. They think they're fantastic. And then we go through a system where we're taught that our grades are our value. We're taught that failing is bad. We're taught that success is when we do something quickly, easily and on our own. We're taught to compare, <clears throat> we're taught to compete, we're taught to fit in, we're bombarded with imagery from um, the media, from the news, from uh, caregivers, friends, family, about what it is to be successful, or maybe what we think our job role should look like. We've got people that we've watched and we've idolised and we thought to be successful, we should be like them. Now, there'll be some stuff that we want to keep and that we choose, but there's also some stuff that we were told when we were much younger that actually there wasn't much format or basis behind. It was just because that's how it's always been done. That's what's always been passed down. And all of that can then form this little narrative that we have in our head, that negative voice that we never choose. And Claire and I talk a lot about this on Vet Empowered, knowing that we have up to 60,000 thoughts every day, 95% are repetitive and 80% are negative. We have negativity bias as humans, we, we're human. So what is important to remember is that quite often, because our subconscious mind is huge. It makes up about 80% of our mind. Our conscious mind is only about four to 10%. Our conscious mind is what we're aware of in that moment. Our subconscious, bear in mind how much information we are bombarded with at any second of any day, we'll have to screen some of that to decide what's important to our conscious mind. So it'll scan a situation based on the past, based on things that we've been taught and come up with a little narrative about it. So for example, if we learned that failing is bad, because we've um, maybe had an experience at school, remembering that we're all different. We've all had different experiences. Some will be common, some will come together and we've all experienced, but other times we'll have things that happen to us. So for example, say if we failed an exam, someone was angry with us for failing for whatever reason that was, or someone made a mean comment, then in our subconscious mind, we've got a belief that failing is a bad thing. So even when we get older, even when we're in our twenties, our thirties, our forties, we fail an exam, the first feelings and narratives that are going to come up for us are, this is really bad. You're a bad person. All the things that the inner critic said, which is that little negative voice that we never chose. So that's also a similar one. 
that's going to impede and start to give us those narratives around being an imposter. And we'll talk about some of the narratives that it comes up with very shortly as well. So talking about us understanding thoughts and the inner critic, I think what we've got to remember is that that little negative voice that we never chose that isn't us, we're the listener underneath that we were handed as we went through life, through things that we saw, things that were repeated to us, things that we inferred from watching situations, how we watched our primary caregivers, how they acted and all these things actually at its core wanted to keep us safe. Now, sometimes it doesn't do a very good job at that. Sometimes you think, no, Katie, it's not trying to keep me safe. It's just trying to stand in my way and it's really annoying. Deep down, it wants to keep us away from something that we perceive as scary. Just sometimes further down the line in like real life and not child life, it's actually really frustrating and can get in the way. But when we understand that, we can start to acknowledge it and start to say, hey, I know you've been trying to keep me safe from the scary failure thing. I know you've been trying to get me to do it perfectly first time because that seems like the safest option, but these things don't exist. So when we all realize that all of us in one way or another will experience something similar, for some people it's going to be a voice, for some people it's going to be a tone of voice, for some people it's going to be a feeling that comes up, for some people it's going to be like a vision that you see dependent on how you experience thoughts. This doesn't disappear completely, but we can start to discredit its opinion. Claire and I have said already, we still listen to it probably as many times a day. Oh, you're an imposter. I went and gave a talk for a university last night. On my way there, it popped up a couple of times. Oh, well, you haven't quite done what you were supposed to do 10 years after leaving this university, have you? And look, you hear back talking to them about this, blah, 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 blah. It's like, oh, thanks for your input. But this is the reason why I'm going. So just to remember, we've all got one. It tries to keep us safe. It's not always that clear why it's trying to do that, but it's not you. You're the valuable one-off person underneath. Strip all that back that you never chose. You're still there, right? And your value doesn't sit on the external stuff. Your value is at level of being, not at a level of doing, even when we do forget. So when we think about the narratives of that little inner critic that pops up that we never, ever chose, it's really useful for us to look at the five different types of imposter archetypes that were um, denoted by Valerie Young in the 1980s. She had done lots of work with lots of people that felt like imposters and she started to spot there were five common narratives that came up again and again. And this is not one of like a Facebook test of us saying, oh, which one am I? Because you're probably going to experience a couple of them, if not all of them at some point. This is a super useful cheat sheet of going, oh, that's one of the pressures that I notice that voice puts on me from time to time. So we can start to bust it and we can have a bit of a rebuttal to it. We know what we'd say counteractively to it. And it helps us just discredit the witness and unmask what it's saying. So here are the five briefly. And I know, again, we talked a little bit about this before. We've got the perfectionist, that is um, where that narrative focuses on the how, wants you to have got 100%. If you've not got 100%, then you're an imposter, then you've not done a good enough job. Claire and I say frequently, perfect doesn't exist. Perfect is a mind-made concept that actually, especially within our industries, doesn't exist. Yes, we can always strive to do better, but actually sometimes it's set the bar so high to something that doesn't actually exist. The super person, this is the narrative saying you should juggle every single role in your life perfectly, brilliantly. You should be able to show up and be the best at everything that you do. And that might involve sometimes bringing in aspects of our parenting. For example, you should be the super parent. You should be the brilliant career person. You should have the spotless, tidy house. You should do all these things or you're getting it wrong. The soloist is where that narrative focuses on who's done it and says, look, if you've had help with this, you've scammed everyone, you should be able to do this completely on your own, because so often we were praised for that, weren't we? Oh, you're so clever, you've done that completely on your own, well done. So it's a pressure that we listen to. We've got the natural genius, that's the person that was always praised when they were younger, oh, you're so clever, you do things so quickly, you do them so easily. They were maybe um, setting the bar quite high for themselves, but they, they want it to be easy, or if something takes effort and takes work, that inner critic comes along and says, yeah, but you worked harder than everyone else. This is sound familiar. And then finally, we've got the expert where that inner critic expects you to know absolutely everything because at some point it's been dangerous not to know something. At some point we've been told off for not knowing something or we've had a negative experience from not knowing something. The reality is, right, nobody knows everything. No single person out there 
in any of our industries knows everything. Yet how frequently does that little voice ask us to be the person that does? Not knowing one thing does not take away from all the stuff that you do know. So right now, I'm going to hand to Claire in a second. She's going to start talking through one of these toolkit items that we can use, because some of this might have started to resonate with you. Oh, my goodness. I listen to those narratives. They come up for me. What can I do when they do come up? And this is a point for us really just to lean back into that curiosity piece that we spoke about at the beginning, that everything is with curiosity and not criticism. So, Claire, do you want to talk through our first toolkit item? Absolutely. So the first toolkit item is called the stop tool. And it sounds super simple, but it's super, super effective. And it's one of the favorite tools we use um, through the Vet Empowered Programme. So it stands for stop, take a breath, observe without judgment and proceed. So definitely take a note of this and the way that this works is I would like you to, we, in fact, we can, let's use the tool just now. So I'd love everybody just to pause, whatever you're doing, just take a breath, take a few deep breaths into the belly and out and another one into the belly and out. Just notice, are there any thoughts that are present? Are there any feelings? Is there a story that's going around your mind just now? A voice that you're aware of we're just going to notice it without judgment when we do this we're just practicing becoming the observer of our thoughts and our feelings and then just decide how you want to proceed so if there's a thought that's been looping round and round you might decide just to let that thought go if there's a feeling that's present you can just notice that the feelings there I want to gently let that go as well so with this tool this is something that you can practice anywhere which is why it's so, so helpful. So I'd always suggest using this initially in really low pressure situations. So it might be that you're sitting in the car in traffic. It might be that you're standing in the supermarket queue and you're like, oh my goodness, I just want to go home and make my dinner and the person in front's taking ages. Just pull out the stop tool, just stop. Just connect with your breath for a moment. Just notice what's coming up and then decide how you want to proceed. So effectively, when we do this, we're allowing ourselves to make more conscious choices. We can choose to respond rather than just reacting in a situation. But remembering we always do this without judgment and we are human and sometimes in life, we are going to react because it happens so quickly. We don't even have that opportunity to slow down. But this is just something that's really useful to start integrating on a day-to-day -day basis. And be curious with it. Just have fun. Be like, cool, do you know what? I'm going to try this out. I'm going to see what comes up. And then what happens is you can start to use it in more challenging situations. So perhaps you've got a client or a customer who's being a little bit difficult. Or you are having a discussion with your partner and it's getting a little bit heated. Or you're just feeling really, really frustrated. This is a tool that you can start to use. And again, it's just allowing you to connect back to the present moment, to just observe non-judgmentally any thoughts that are coming up, any feelings, and then make a more conscious choice moving forward. So allowing you to respond rather than react. But again, this is practice. If you use it the first few times and you're like, oh, I don't feel like it made much difference, persevere. It's a little bit like when we decide that, we want to get fit, right? And we go to the gym. If we went to the gym once and then came out, we'd be pretty disappointed if we expected we'd be running a marathon, right? It's going to take time. It's going to take practice. It's going to take some consistency. But it's definitely really, really useful to start using this. And again, it's a tool that we use a lot on Vet Empowered. And everybody loves it, don't they, Katie? Like, always find it really helpful. They do. This is probably one of the number one takeaways. And that's why we wanted to gift it to you in this session, because it seems so simple. But how infrequently do we actually check in? OK, what am I actually listening to that we look at curiously? How am I actually feeling? Because often we go through that treadmill of the day and we get to the end and we're like, goodness, what happened today? And bringing it back even to the imposterism piece is sometimes when we've got something new, more challenging that's coming up, or like Claire said, just flexing it in day to day life is, in that observe moment, oh, that's that's really interesting. 
I'm asking myself to do this completely on my own or I'm asking myself to be able to do this in three days when I've not not done any training in this just yet or in this moment I'm listening to a narrative saying that I'm not good at my job because this one thing that happened and actually when I step back in this moment I can see there's like 10,000 things that I've done why I do deserve it but it just helps us kind of almost if you imagine a movie scene's being filmed and it's just that someone yells cut and you you go oh hang on I'm just going to go and examine what's actually going on here curiously and then decide like how do I want this scene to play out now what's going to happen moving forward from here is it that I'm going to take a physical action is it that I'm going to let go of thoughts like Claire said is it that what do I need in this moment so it's a super powerful check-in especially if we're feeling like an imposter just to notice without judgment and why do we say why do we keep saying without judgment really lean into this because what that means is so frequently when people do what we call raise their self-awareness and start to notice in that observe point what comes up for them sometimes we end up criticizing ourselves about criticizing ourselves so that's why we say without judgment just look curiously that's really interesting that that's come up for me and let's be on our own side right we've said already about a self-relationship being a super powerful thing now that's something to make sure you've written that one down as you can see it's an acronym so we've got s for stop t for take a breath o for observe and p for proceed and we actually love on vet empowered just asking people to give themselves a reminder of it that might be they have a phone screen background or they've got a little post-it note we've had people that say oh you know what i leave a post-it note by the kettle that just says stop and when i go and put the kettle on for a couple of tea that's where i decide i'm going to use the tool or i have one in the car so these are really like useful check-ins just for us to check and see how am I actually feeling in this moment and what's coming up for me? Amazing. Thank you so much, Katie. I was just going to jump in, Claire, and just say we've had an anonymous question that's come through um, just with regards to the stop tool. And I thought this was a really useful thing for us to, to cover as well. Just saying sometimes when I'm applying this technique, it feels like it increases that voice of feeling like I'm not good enough. I can use it in other situations to relax. But when it comes to work, it doesn't seem to, to work quite as well. So I thought that'd be a really good thing for us just to cover here, because sometimes when yeah. we start to notice what's coming up for us, sometimes that's almost where that criticism comes in. So I wondered if you just touch on that non-judgmental piece that I Claire, when you covered the technique. Yeah, absolutely. So what happens is like naturally as we start to raise our self-awareness and start to become more aware of the thoughts or the stories or the narratives that are going on in our heads, there can be this tendency where we criticize ourselves for criticizing ourselves. So we'll be like, oh my goodness, like, why am I saying this to myself? I shouldn't be saying that. And we place an awful lot of judgment. So with this tool, what I really, really want you to lean into is just being curious about what comes up. And something that can be really helpful to say is that's really interesting. It's really interesting that that is the thoughts that I'm having, or that is the story that I'm telling myself. And We'll cover this more later on in the workshop, but being able to lean into that self-compassion and that kindness piece as well. So when we notice what's coming up, being curious about it, okay, that's really interesting. And then thinking about, okay, like what would I say to a friend if they were experiencing these feelings right now, if they were having these thoughts? Because sometimes it can be easier for us to lean into kindness and compassion coming from that angle rather than applying it directly to ourselves, especially because self-compassion isn't something that we get taught, right? We don't really get taught this at school or college or uni or work, you know, from our backgrounds. So, um, yeah, I think it's totally natural that when you first start using this, it, it's going to feel uncomfortable because you're becoming more consciously aware of the narratives and the thoughts that are there. But yeah. with practice, with leaning into curiosity, it does start to get a little bit easier. Yeah. If you enjoyed this podcast, please hit the subscribe button so you get notified every time I load a new podcast. I'm here every week talking to vet rehab therapists from all over the world about all things vet rehab. Now, don't forget to bookmark our next vet rehab summit. This is on Friday the 10th and Saturday the 11th of November. Come and be a part of the world's largest online veterinary rehabilitation conference created specifically for you, the vet rehabber community. Online Pet Health members, you get VIP complimentary access to the vet rehab summit. For more information about continued education for vet rehabbers, you can go to onlinepethealth.com.